Let me give you one example just to shake up our understanding of uh, repeatability a little bit before we then go back and adopt a pragmatic attitude and say we will replicate nevertheless. Hmm? And this is not uh, a, a switch to, I don't know, a, a talk on, on literature or Steinbeck or whatever, but it has to do with a famous test of replicability. It was conducted by uh, a researcher named John Crabb in the late 1990s and famously published in Science. And this was an attempt to, to make sure that uh, different confounding variables in scientific research could be controlled and that we could really get the same findings if we made sure that we avoided any factors that could interfere with our results. The study was not even done on men or women, uh, but on mice, as is so often the case in laboratory research, and had to do with the genetics of mouse behavior, that's the official title, interaction with laboratory environment. The study dealt with the additional anxiety induced by cocaine um, injections in mice. Maybe it's good that mice were the, the, the guinea pigs for that, as it were. Maybe there are people who wouldn't want to volunteer for cocaine injections, but anyway, it was done on, on mice and measuring the additional anxiety that you get operationalized as the additional movement, the additional running around that these mice would do. Okay. Uh, that this kind of mouse behavior was measured in three different scientific laboratories in different places, New York, Edmonton uh, in Canada, and Portland, three different labs. And the, the goal was to, in, to show that if you eliminated all confounding variables, um, you get the same results. The question is, what might be a confounding variable? What might interfere? And I think the researchers were ingenious. If I show you the list of things that they controlled for, it's really quite thorough, I would say. The same strand of laboratory mice, uh, obviously the same genetic um, strains of mice, uh, shipped the same day from the same supplier, uh, breeding the mice, raised in the same kind of enclosure with the same bedding, you know, sleeping on the same bedding, uh, exposed to the same amount of light and living with the same number of litter mates, fed the exact same type of, of food, handled with the same type of surgical glove, tested on the same kind of equipment in the same time in the morning in all three labs, everything standardized, genetically the same, uh, so we should really get the same results, right? Well, they didn't. And in one case in particular, they had a result that is simply beyond explanation. Not a measurement error, but in terms of uh, 600 centimeters of additional movement or 700 and in one lab 5,000 centimeters of additional movement. And the point that John Crabb made that you could do some selective reporting of data and you could say if just focusing on the, imagine that only the team in Portland had done the study. They would say we measured this and injecting a certain defined amount of cocaine in these mice gave us 5,000 centimeters of additional movement as an indicator of anxiety. And if the same study had been done in Albany, same conditions, the findings would have been completely different. And it makes you wonder, that's just my basic point, clinical research. You know, you have some 30 patients in a certain country, in a certain hospital maybe, and you study a drug, and you study it in a different country, whether that amount of control of possibly confounding variables is ever possible in clinical research with human beings and if not, all these findings, the average clinical effect of a drug, yes, effective or not effective, whether we can really conf be confident that uh, this kind of scientific testing in human beings is, is reliable enough to then draw the conclusions that the drug company will invest millions in developing and marketing a drug, yes or no. 
I'm not uh, expressing a fundamental disbelief in scientific research, but this has shown the scientific community of, of sort of hardcore scientists that the notion of repetition and replication and replicability is problematic even in the more natural sciences in, in biology where it's easier, it should be easier to control for different factors. Now imagine, now we're talking about translators or interpreters as human beings in a certain social environment, culture, institution, and then we group them for sameness, right? And compare them whether that amount of variability uh, wouldn't be likely to obscure some effects that we want to, to find in our studies. Now on that happy note, <laughs> as a preliminary note, we'd still say that it makes sense to ask people questions, to collect data, and analyze the findings, but uh, uh, with the caveat that repeatability in the human sciences is problematic and it's even a problem in the clinical or biological sciences. As at least it's good to be aware of it and uh, the more we're aware of it, maybe the more testing we do, the more replication we do and maybe the higher our standards should be in order to be able to claim that some scientific findings are really reliable and valid. Uh, the problem with replication, therefore, is, is not only this variability, there are also some social issues involved. Everybody says that replication is important, it should be done, but it's not very often uh, practiced and it's not very often published. That's one of the problems. I would say, as much as I would recommend to master's students that you should replicate a study, we could say go out and replicate, uh, go forth and replicate, um, it's quite hard to do replication studies well because you need full access to all the original material and data in order to make sure that you're having the same conditions. Just think of the mice. And uh, then you want to make sure the same questions are asked uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, also sometimes journals that's less relevant for master studies want to publish new research new findings rather than a study that says we found the same things that somebody found 10 years ago. They say, so what? Uh, why should we publish that? But many people say that this should be published. By publishing replica sound replication, uh, we make sure that uh, the reliability of the findings in the scientific community is enhanced. So they should be published more. Sometimes they're, they're not that attractive. And the problem is also when you manage to successfully replicate a study, the, the main credit goes with the original authors. They designed the method, they came up with the idea, and so it's their effect that you uh, found and confirmed. And if you don't find the same effect, if you refute their findings, well, that, sociologically speaking, is not always welcome in a community. If somebody comes up with brilliant findings, gets all the glory and for publishing it, and somebody else comes along and says, you were all wrong. I couldn't replicate your effect. So you don't make friends by <laughs> not finding the same results. Anyway, that's a basic problem in many fields, and the uh, same thing in our field. Uh, what we, to, to, to take a, a pragmatic approach, I think we have to realize that it's very difficult to replicate all aspects of a study usually. Something will usually be different. And in that sense, replication in the strict sense doesn't really take place. And we do not confirm the validity of the original study because for that we'd have to have everything the same. Think of the mice. But we rather extend the external validity. Let's say we do a survey among uh, translators in Spain, and we ask the same, or uh, translators in, in the Barcelona region, and then we do the same study among translators in the Madrid uh, region. So that alone is a difference. Uh, we're not repeating the same thing because we're uh, dealing with a different market, but there's enough sameness for it to be called a replication, but we extend the findings then to the Madrid population, which is very valuable because then we can claim that what was found for the Barcelona public, um, population actually holds true also, can be extended to the population of translators in Madrid. And that is a very realistic and useful concept. Some people talk about partial replication. 
We are not claiming that you're repeating the same thing, but you're replicating the main method, but applying it to a different population. You change an aspect, but by doing so, you actually uh, uh, extend its validity by making the findings more generalizable. Uh, this, uh, these authors, other authors have called this replication with extension, extending it to a different uh, aspect. Or as you can see here, it could be a different population, different uh, product, different time period, different organization, geograph geographical area, different research team or whatever. Just making sure that the original findings don't hold true only in a particular place for a particular group of people. And it's in that sense of a partial replication or a replication by extension that uh, we believe our, the study that I'm going to present was carried out as an example of a, of a useful replication. Hmm? Uh, just by way of introduction, a few words about replication and interpreting studies before we go into the, the case. Uh, it has been remarked, and I liked at the Turku conference in 1994 by, by John Dodds, that there's actually uh, a concern with newness, with innovation in science. We always want to discover something new, and he says, what seems to be happening then, we have reached the moon, we've discovered some, something new, but then nobody is longer, any longer interested uh, in it. Its exploration and colonization seem to be of secondary importance. Forms of life there, he says, have become irrelevant because it seems we must proceed at all costs with, to the next planet, basically, the next star, the new goal, uh, new findings, new problems. And uh, this, I take this, I read this also as a plea to say, okay, we've had a new finding on a new issue, but the reaction should say, let's test it, let's validate it, let's check it, let's replicate it, and be concerned with it for a longer period of time before we move on to a, a completely new topic and completely new study. So again, a way of saying that we should cultivate the research problems that have been uh, introduced, interesting findings introduced, but we should take them as an as an invitation to look at that again and uh, establish a more solid basis. So in favor of replication, uh, not much of which has been done in the field of interpreting studies. Some examples, for instance, the study by Geli Chernov, an experimental study, uh, was replicated by an MA student in Italy, Laura Carlet. Uh, and by the way, very often people assume that replication is associated with experimental research. You replicate an experiment. And the point is, as I said in the introduction, you don't only replicate experiments, you can also replicate survey research. Another example was an aptitude testing study done by Gerver and the team in the 1980s. And that has very ambitiously been replicated now by colleagues in Belgium. And for that, the study is still in prog progress because it's so complicated. Imagine Gerver had to design, I think, 12 different uh, types of tests and tasks on which to test interpreting students in English and English and French and whatever languages. And for Belgium, it had to be reinvented, new tests created, uh, new materials created. And for that to be comparable and the same is a real nightmare. To, to replicate this kind of study with a whole battery of psychological tests, but it has been done. And uh, so far we haven't had uh, results, but that's, that should be a major example of replication of an, of an experimental study. And then a case that doesn't really fit the strict definition of uh, replication, Angela Collados of the University of uh, Granada did a much quoted study on the effect of intonation, the interpreter's intonation, on uh, the perception of quality by users, users' judgment of the quality of what they hear. And uh, Angela was courageous enough to replicate that study. Now we said that it should be independent. She replicated her own study. The point is, she after for years we've been 
going around publishing that uh, poor intonation will have a significant negative effect on the audience's judgment of the quality of an interpretation and the professionalism of the interpreter. Well, she replicated the study and she didn't find that significant effect any longer. Hmm, what do we do? Was, uh, do another study, basically. It's very difficult because she had to do the same kind of population. Uh, legal experts in Spain, um, I think f about 40, 42 law professors in at the University of Granada were the original subjects, and then she worked with another group of 40 legal experts, law professors in a different region, and by now I think she's exhausted the population of legal experts, so the question is how could we replicate the study in Spain, but it should be replicated because that's, it's an important finding, that's something we thought was interesting, and really I've, in my work, I've, I've mentioned this many times because it's so significant, also the implications for teaching. If our students don't manage a lively interpretation, uh, intonation, well, their work will never be considered very professional, even though it's complete and logical and everything, because apparently audiences react so strongly to monotonous intonation. Well, now we don't know. Do they really react so strongly? And by the way, that is the response of a certain group of legal experts in Spain. We don't really know whether that holds true in Japan or in, in France or in Denmark. So you see the need for replication for extension studies even of such uh, a piece of research. And we're all too often uh, assuming that if something has been done by one researcher in a certain location, she's found the result and we just basically accept it and publish and, and, and accept it as the truth. And we should be a bit more careful as this example has shown us. And uh, another example is the study by Bühler that I will be talking about. It was replicated by Chiaro Nocella, replicated again uh, by in a master's thesis in France and replicated in the core in the as part of our uh, project the and that's the main case example that I like to present in my talk hmm? and dimension of the study our claim was quality is not only a judgment but the ultimate test for quality in our project was do they get the message do they fully get the message as well, uh, and, and are there criteria like intonation and fluency that make it more difficult for the, for the users to get the message?